I would like to take a few moments to introduce you to Minuteman Missile Historic Site. Minuteman Missile is one of the newest sites in the Park Service system, and it's the only one created to tell a story from the Cold War. Uh, Launch Control Facility Delta-1 was here for one reason, and that was to support the two missile airs that were stationed 31 feet below the surface. The Launch Control Facility uh, had a minimum of eight uh, personnel. There was a facilities manager, uh, a cook, and six security police. The facility itself was uh, created to look similar to a ranch-style house, and around the facility you would see a code burner, a helicopter pad, uh, communication equipment, a basketball hoop, a uh, uh, volleyball court, and, and horseshoes. Within the facility itself, there was one very important area called the uh, flights or the uh, security control center, and that was manned by the uh, flight security controller. He was responsible for all radio communication, telephone communication. He'd watch the front gate and he could allow those personnel that had authority or authorized to come on uh, onto the site uh, with a, an electronic switch. When missileers would come on duty, the two-man missileer team, they would come into this facility, they would call downstairs to the uh, control capsule, and uh, they would exchange uh, authentication codes, and once that authentication process was completed, the commander down below would unlock the door upstairs, and the missileers uh, coming on duty would get into an elevator and transcend the 31 feet to the uh, command module be below, they would come to a blast door. This was an eight-ton steel and concrete reinforced blast door. It secured the capsule itself. It had uh, uh, it was locked with some hydraulically controlled pins. You can see them on the side of the door there. They would uh, extend into the uh, frame itself. Now there was only two times when this door would be open, and that would be obviously at shift change. But the other time would be when uh, some other personnel, some uh, 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 personnel that was authorized to go into the, the module, this might be uh, uh, maintenance people, it might be a cook sending meal, a meal down to the uh, two missileers on duty. And before going into this uh, capsule, you would pass a sign that said, No Loan Zone, Two Man Concept Mandatory. Wherever you saw that sign in any facility, it was a highly secured uh, area, and at no time could only one person be in that area. There was always two. That was for security reasons. They didn't want just one person being able to mess around in there. Now, the most important duty that the missileers would ever carry out would be to fire a missile. And before they were able to do that, they would have to hear an emergency war order. And that would be uh, a loud warbling sound that would come across their speaker. It would sound something like that. That would be followed by a, an, auth a, an authentication code that would come across their equipment. The, uh, once they got that message, the commander and the deputy would each go through the authentication process. And once that was done, once it, the authentication was completed, they would go to a red lock box uh, and they would unlock the... Uh, uh, their, their two padlocks. They would bring these padlocks on duty with them, by the way. They would each have a padlock with their own uh, padlock uh, combination. They would unlock that box. They would, take out a, they would each take out a key. There would be a set of keys, one for the commander and one for the deputy. Those, t those keys would fit into a key slot, into a turn slot. Those slots would be located 12 feet apart, and they were uh, 12 feet apart for a reason, so that one person couldn't uh, unlock those uh, uh, those locks and, and fire a missile. And we'll see here in just a second, uh, just quickly, the commander's key slot was in his area and the deputy's was in his uh, station there. Uh, these two missileers were in this uh, uh, capsule for 24 hours in a row. They were 24 hours on, 24 hour off. This would get kind of long. So the Air Force tried to give them a certain amount of creature comforts. They'd have a bunk where they could uh, uh, take a nap as they had time to sleep uh, for a little while. They had a microwave oven, a refrigerator, they had a TV. Um, that TV was added later actually. In the, the, the initial uh, uh, 
initially that TV wasn't part of the, the capsule, he added that later, and that, that, was, that was controlled by the people upstairs in the day room, and we'll talk about the day room here in just a minute. The, the, whatever the people upstairs were watching is what these folks in this capsule would watch, so you wanted to be, uh, probably get along with those folks up in the day room. Uh, here's the day room. The day room was a place where all personnel could come and relax. They had a lot of extra time. And they could watch TV, they had books and magazines, board games, there was a telephone they could call off-site as, as uh, time permitted, as they were allowed. There was also bunks and tables here in the day room, and they could, or not bunks, there were booths and tables, and they could order a hot meal from the kitchen. The kitchen was right next to the day room. The cook would prepare four meals a day. It would be breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a midnight meal. That midnight meal, of course, was for those personnel who were coming off duty at midnight. Just down the hall from the kitchen was the uh, uh, room where the security police stayed. It was a dorm-like room. There were bunk beds in there. The windows were blacked out in this room so that the personnel coming off duty during daylight hours, they'd go in here and have a sense of nighttime and they could get, get to sleep and get some rest. In this room also where the security police stayed, there was a round tin canister that was filled with, with sand. And the, the reason for that was is that the security police, at the end of their shift, would come to that can. They'd point their, their uh, handgun or their M16, uh, whichever they happened to be carrying, they would, they would point it into that barrel and pull the trigger. Hopefully they'd hear a click. Uh, if not, if there was a live round in, their, in the chamber and it went off, that sand would absorb that, that shell. And they didn't want that to happen. Just down the hall from where the security police stayed was the facilities manager's uh, room, and, and it was the only single bed unit in the facility. The facilities manager had a pretty big job. He had to make sure that all of the personnel that were on duty performed what they were required to do. He also had to make sure that all of the equipment needed to support this facility was in working order. Uh, he could perform, he and his, his people were were able to perform a certain amount of, of maintenance. If he was unable to, he could call off site and get the uh, required assistance that he needed. Now the missile itself uh, was, was several miles away from the command center and Delta 9, we're going to take a look at Delta 9, was several miles away from Delta 1 control and it was located, it was hidden in plain sight if you will, it was about a half a mile from I-90 um, and around this facility there was uh, various uh, communications antennas and other equipment necessary to maintain this facility. There was a, uh, uh, a generator that would kick in in case they lost power because they always wanted to keep this, this missile online at all times. And the missile itself, oh and there were 150 of these by the way located across western South Dakota. Now the missile itself was contained within a, uh, a concrete reinforced silo, a missile launcher if you will. Uh, this, this Minuteman missile system was pretty technologically advanced for, the, for that time. It replaced the uh, liquid fuel systems of the time like the Atlas and the uh, Titan. Uh, it was uh, very inexpensive to maintain, to build and maintain this uh, uh, this system, uh, and the, the, one of the things that's really really important to remember about Minuteman is that it could set dormant for for weeks and days, even years on end, with just a minimal amount uh, of maintenance. And again, like I say, it was inexpensive; it cost about a fifth of the liquid uh, liquid fuel systems of the time. It was also a very rapid uh, response, rapid fire, uh, hair trigger type system, if you will, in that from the time that the commander and the deputy heard that war order, uh, warble that you heard before, until they could fire one of these missiles, could take less than five minutes. So it was a, a tremendous deterrent. It, it, had the Russians fired, we could have responded rapidly, uh, and of course we're, we're Glad that didn't happen, or we wouldn't be here talking about it right now. But it was a it was a tremendous deterrent uh, at the time. There's a new version of Minuteman, an updated version called Minuteman Three, and it's slated to stay online until the year 2025. So it's going to be the Minuteman system is going to be an integral part of our national defense 
for for quite some time. I, and, and just in a in a few minutes, I can't possibly begin to tell you all of the uh, fascinating, interesting, and important facts about Minuteman and about the Cold War. I would uh, invite you to visit the Minuteman site um, and, or if you can't visit the site, by all means visit the website and the web addresses here. But if you, if at all possible, visit the, the site itself, take a, t a tour, go down into the capsule and actually see where these folks were stationed and, and the environment that they lived in. Uh, and, and the work that they did, and it was important work, I think. So, visit the site, visit the website, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend just a few minutes to tell you uh, just briefly about Minuteman Missile. Thank you.